Danielle Arion Bell was a 14-year-old from Pensacola, Florida. She was the wild child of the family, but had a good heart. On September 28, 2001, she had been grounded by her mother. Still, Danielle snuck out of the house and attended a party thrown by some older men. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. When you hear that word, what definition do you think of first? If you're a pilot, you think of not being able to fly because of snow or whatever reason. If you're someone who is concerned with her own well-being, you think of being humble and modest and not being arrogant and selfish. Then if you're a child or parent, you think of punishment, the penalty you dole out or receive for improper behavior. But you know what's funny? Although these three definitions are seemingly different and get their own sentence or paragraph in a dictionary, they are actually quite the same. All three have to do with altering behavior so danger is avoided, whether immediately or somewhere down the road. In Daniel Bell's case, we can see all three definitions expressed. Her mother ordered her to stay home on September 28, 2001. Why? and to correspond with the preceding definitions. One, because she was afraid her daughter was flying a little too high, like Icarus. Number two, because she thought it was time to teach her daughter some humility and caution because teenagers can't teach that to themselves. Number three, because Daniel had misbehaved and now it was time to hand out the punishment. But it didn't work. Danielle ignored her mother's instructions. Danielle didn't want to be grounded. She wanted to take flight. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's site, charlieproject.org. Danielle disappeared on September 28, 2001. But several months prior to her disappearance, she'd become secretly involved with a man in his 20s, Alfredo Sanchez Jr. On the surface, the story was that Danielle was babysitting Alfredo's children. Danielle's family eventually discovered the real story that Alfredo and Danielle were having sex. Given Danielle's age, this meant Alfredo was engaging in statutory rape. In addition, although there is no proof of this except Danielle's word, it is believed that Danielle was pregnant with Alfredo's child before she went missing. On the night in question, Danielle's mother had forbade her from seeing Alfredo and ordered her to stay home. However, Danielle went out with some friends anyway and she eventually found her way to the house of Robert Bassett a close friend of Alfredo Sanchez, where a party was being held. According to some of the attendees, Daniel was there and very drunk. They also say that Daniel was still at the home when everyone else left. Yet Robert Bassett insists that Daniel left with some of her friends, a story he has repeated to this day. Whatever the case, Daniel was never seen again after this party. Further adding to the mystery of what happened to Danielle, a friend of hers one of the last people to see her sent the family on a wild goose chase after September 28th and held out for several days before coming forward with the story about the party. Danielle's case is still unsolved. Her family believes harm came to her that night. The interview for this episode is with Danielle's sister, Bonnie Anderson. Unfound News Florida's Missing Person Day is December 14th in Tallahassee. I will be there, so if you've been wanting to meet me, and I surely have been wanting to meet all of you, you'll be able to find me there. I'm looking forward to attending. Next, I'm continuing to work on Volume 2. It'll be out soon. What's held me up is all the work I've been doing for the podcast. I've been on the phone a lot. I've been helping some future guests with people they've been looking for. In one case, locating a person who has been kind of off the radar for 30 years. I'll tell you more about that when I'm able. Podcast work always takes precedent over everything else. So Volume 2 will be out soon. Next, 
Although I wasn't technically there for it, Unfound had a meeting this past week concerning one more way to bring missing persons cases to a wider audience. The meeting went well, and I will weigh Unfound's options regarding this opportunity. What's most important is that I will not allow the plight of missing persons families and the epidemic of people going missing to be watered down in any way. If their stories are going to be told, it has to be done truthfully and realistically. Finally, and finally, I can make the big announcement I've been talking about for two weeks. Unfound is now being carried by Trib Total Media, publisher of the Tribune Review newspaper in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Their website is triblive.com. And to get to Unfound there, it's triblive.com forward slash news forward slash unfound. I will also be working with them to publish a once a month in-depth article on a missing persons case from Western Pennsylvania. This will start in January. This is a tremendous opportunity for myself and the podcast, but as with everything else Unfound does, the goal is to use this new venture to solve cases. Period. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Podbean, and Overcast. The email address is unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. The website, unfoundpodcast.com. Please check out the Secret Stephen Kocher episode. Amazon.com, Volume 1, in both ebook and print form. Patreon, you can start contributing to Unfound for as low as $2 a month. And please mention Unfound on all the true crime Facebook pages and other websites and forums. Thank you. I'm very happy to have on this episode of Unfound the sister of Danielle Bell, Bonnie Anderson. Bonnie, welcome to Unfound. Thank you for having me. Tell the listeners a little bit about your younger sister, Danielle. Um, You're, I think, eight years older than she is. What was it like being her older sister? And uh, about your childhood, what do you remember uh, about that going back to your earlier days? Okay, um, Danielle was uh, six years younger than me. So she was the youngest of the three of us, um, with our brother in the middle. Um, Danielle was always the baby of the family, and she was definitely the most uh, daring, and she was a risk taker. She was very vibrant, uh, had a lot of personality. Mm. Um, she was, like I said, definitely the baby of the family. Growing up, um, you know, she and I shared a room most of the time, and I was always kind of like a mother figure to her as far as, you know, trying to advise her on making good decisions and uh, keeping her side of the room clean and you know, just, uh, it was a very, much of a older sister type of relationship for me, especially as, you know, mm-hmm. trying to reel her back in from, <clears throat> you know. Why do you think that th- that was, that maybe she was a little bit more of a risk taker uh, than I'm guessing than you or your brother were? W- what do you think that was? It was just genetics, or did she just get a little bit different parenting uh, as maybe as a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old? Oh, I definitely think that uh, it was a combination of, of both. She had, she, well, she won. She was the baby of the family, so, you know, she was treated as such. Uh, she did have a little less um, strict rules than my brother and I did, uh, especially from our, from our dad. Uh, Danielle was with my mom most of the time as a child you know after my brother and I had started school she was you know home with my mom my mom was a stay-at-home mom for quite a while Mm -hmm. and I think it was just in her nature too Danielle was just uh you know more extroverted whereas I was total introvert would rather have been in a tree reading a book she was more of the let me go see what kids in the neighborhood are, or you know, can go outside and play today. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she, she, it was just in her nature. She just definitely had that uh, 
desire and drive in her to just be more social and try new things and um, meet different people, meet new people. And how did she do in school? Uh, she was a fairly good student. Um, she was very smart. Um, she enjoyed uh, more creative things. Um, I recall as a kid, she loved coloring was one of her favorite things to do. Uh, she always was coloring, <clears throat> you know, in the evening times as children. It's one thing I remember about her very vividly. Mm -hmm. um, she, and she was a good student. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that she was only 14 when she disappeared. So she is one of the uh, younger people we've covered on Unfound who has disappeared. Uh, we have another um, victim recently uh, who was only 12, but she was only, but Danielle's only 14. Um, what was her interest in hobbies is uh, maybe just getting to those teenage years before she disappeared? Dan Danielle, uh, growing up, had um, been a cheerleader mm -hmm. for the Inslee Chiefs. Uh, all the way through until she went missing. She was a cheerleader. That was a very big interest for her. <clears throat> she, you know, she was beautiful. Um, so she was into, as most teenage girls, shopping and hair and makeup. Uh, she looked much older than what she was. But her her interests were, at that time, around when she disappeared, was definitely cheerleading and hanging out with friends the beach she and i went to the beach together all the time um mm -hmm. and you know as far as school went she'd only been in school less than a month before she went missing so there's no telling how she would have done in high school since she was never given that opportunity um, right right and we're going to get into this in in this case but we might as well touch upon it right now being that you were uh, eight years older than, than she was, when did you, you called her, you know, she was more outgoing than you were, more outgoing than your brother was. When can you remember maybe first seeing something that might have been like a, a yellow flag, maybe not necessarily a red flag, but a yellow flag that maybe she was going a little too far? Any Any recollections of that before we get too deep into this? Um, the very first event that occurred that just didn't settle right with me was about two weeks before she went missing. That soon, that close to when she disappeared. Wow. Okay. okay. So uh, beforehand, I mean, I, I don't recall any specific incident where, you know, she, prior to this, that she, I mean, yeah, she was a little bit more of a... And in, in general, like I said, a risk taker, but I can't think of anything that I thought, oh, well, she's going to head down the wrong path prior to this. You know, I was more of a of the straight-laced kid, so I was probably a little bit too much like, Danielle, you can't do this. You shouldn't do that. You know, you need to put your nose in a book, and, and that's all you need to do, you know. And that was just not the person that she was. Um, but about two weeks before she went missing, I had picked her up from my mom's house and picked my brother up from my dad's house and I took them to the beach to have our pictures taken. And after we were done with the pictures, I had dropped my brother off and as we were leaving my dad's house, she asked me if I would stop by uh, so she could use a payphone. So this was back in 2001. She didn't have a cell phone at the time. She wanted to call some. She told me she wanted to call somebody so they could come get her from the gas station. And I could just drop her off and leave her there. And I said, no, I picked you up from home. And that's where I'm going to drop you off at is back at home. So once we got back, I took her back to my mom's house. Um, the dinner was made, so I was eating dinner. And approximately 30, 45 minutes later, <clears throat> Alfredo Sanchez 
walks in the door. First time I've ever met Alfredo. I'd seen Alfredo or heard of Alfredo. Mm -hmm. He is obviously older to me than he was older than I was. I could tell that instantly. I was only 20 at the time, so he had to be 23, 24. And he had a couple of his friends with him, and they were coming to pick Danielle up. And when I asked my mom what she was doing hanging out with Alfredo, she said she babysat for Alfredo. Well, mm. it didn't sell right with me. I actually got into an argument with my sister and my mother about it, put my plate in the zinc and left, and that was the last time I saw my sister. That's how upset you were about this, that you kind of right, maybe right in the middle of a meal, you know, got out of there because they weren't listening to you and weren't wasn't listening to your better reasoning, probably, I, what I would call it. Yeah, I just found it completely and totally unacceptable for her yeah. to have even been hanging out with him. There was absolutely no reason for her to have been hanging out with Alfredo Sanchez. Okay. Tell the listeners a little bit about Alfredo. Of course, later he's going to play a huge part in this story, but at that point you had never heard of him. You'd never heard your mother mention him. You'd never heard Danielle mention him, or had you even heard of him just being around town even then at that point? Had I heard of him? Yes, no. had, had I, ne never heard of him before Daniel mentioned him to you or you found out when he stopped at the house that day. No, I had never heard of him before. I didn't learn anything further about Alfredo Sanchez until my sister disappeared. I knew nothing. Okay. It was a completely different crowd than what I, who I associated with. Okay, and what you're saying is as soon as you saw him and whoever else come into you, your mother's house that day, you were like, this isn't right. You didn't even know a thing about him, but you knew it. Well, something was kind of weird. Something right wasn't going on. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, and they're in no circumstances. Is it okay? And has it ever been okay in my mind for a 14-year-old girl, child, to hang out with a 24-year-old man? You know, the, right. e e even as babysitting, they're... The, there was no, <laughs> there was no reason, absolutely no reason she should have been hanging out with him. And it, if you can maybe remember that conversation from that day, what did your mother have to say about that? What, what was her oh, defense? She, she what was, said, what, what was it? What did she say? Well, she said that she was babysitting for him. That's what, that's what she said. And that she knew that he she had met him before and Daniel had babysitted for him for a few times and that it was okay. We're going to, I hope the listeners will remember that uh, for later in the conversation, but that's the first time you had heard of Alfredo. That's the first time you knew that Daniel even knew Alfredo. And that is what your mother's uh, response was to it. Maybe I should ask you this. How often were you seeing Danielle in maybe the months before she disappeared? Once a um, week. I know not, you weren't living at home anymore, but how often? Well, we, you know, it was, a, we spent the whole summer going to the beach just about every week, once a week at least. Um, in between when I was you know, off work and school, I would pick her up and we would go to the beach. So about once a week. So we come to maybe just the days before. Did you ever hear anything more about Alfredo between when you saw him that day and when Danielle disappeared? Did you? Did the topic come up with your mother and you again, maybe another argument, anything like that? Or even, I know that was the last time you saw Danielle, but did you talk to her on the phone and maybe talk to her about Danielle or about Alfredo? And those no. never came up again? No. Okay. So what do we know about the day that Danielle disappeared? What can you tell the listeners about that? Uh, Danielle had gone to school uh, on Friday, September 28th, had come home and asked my mom if she could go hang out with friends. My mom told her no. She had been in trouble for something. Well, she had, she had been grounded at this point. Mm -hmm. And 
my mom asked, you know, did she stay home and not go anywhere? My mom left to go to my brother's football game. And when she got back home, Danielle had was not there. Um, on Sunday, September 30th, my mom called the police and reported her missing. Uh, the police immediately classified her as a runaway, um, even though she had not taken any of her belongings with her. I find I found out that she was missing Monday, September 31st, or was that, uh, it was the Monday after, so I think that was actually October 1st, and then we spent the next day searching for her mm-hmm. everywhere we could think of. Now, let's go back to September 28th. So, your mother goes uh, to see your brother's football game, but Danielle doesn't listen to her. What, a- what actually happened there? Danielle decided that she was going to go to a party at the uh, at a park in the same neighborhood as Alfredo Sanchez, which is a little uh, neighborhood near the paper mill. Um, uh, has you know tiny houses and um, a couple of parks in the neighborhood, but she decided she, so with. From our neighborhood, she rode in a car with um, three or four other people to the park that was about three or four miles north, um, attended a party there. Mm -hmm. She was later seen getting in a car with Alfredo Sanchez's brother, Alex Sanchez, and going to a party at Robert Louis Bassett Jr.'s house located at 588 Cedar Tree Lane, um, where there were reports that she had been heavily intoxicated and that she, Alfredo Sanchez was there. And that's where the story starts getting a little, that's where a little crazy. Okay. These other friends who, I guess, picked her up at your mother's house, that's where Danielle was, and took her to this park first, four miles away, um, did they know that uh, Danielle's probably eventual plan was to go to this party at Robert Bassett's? They, you know, having tried to encourage her when they were leaving the party, the, the party in the park to come back with her. To come back home with them, mm-hmm. um, but she did. She, you know, she told them that she did not want to go back home. That she was going to go to this party uh, on Cedar Tree Lane, and that she would catch up with them later. She, you know, what whether or not it was planned to prior, possibly, whether or not in her mind that was her intentions, uh, absolutely could have could be the case. Do I have any proof of that? No. No. Did any of the people, these friends who picked her up at your mother's house, did they end up going to this party at Robert Bassett's later, or was Danielle the only one of that group who went to this other party at Robert Bassett's? And we'll we'll she talk about and we'll talk about him in a moment. But did any of those other friends go with her to this other party? No. No. Do you think any of them even knew Robert Bassett? Now all these years later, do you think any of them knew Robert Bassett? Or and Alfredo Sanchez, or do you think that Danielle was the only one? Do you have any ideas about that? I believe those kids knew of Robert Bassett and knew that he was no good. So he's another bias. Were they as friends? Well. Were you know were they friends with him? No, I don't think so. You know these were neighborhood kids that I had grown up with. Yeah. And I have talked to these these boys since then, and one hundred percent believe everything that they say okay and have full trust that their intentions were not negative right right do, do you think that they knew that uh and of course daniel would have been a- easily been able to cover this up but do you think that they knew that daniel was grounded that night and wasn't supposed to go out i mean kids do what kids do i mean that's just yeah, like, we're sure. all children we were all children you know kids at one time trying to get out of being grounded do you think they sure. knew that? That they, do you think they knew that she was grounded? 
Yeah, and I bet they wanted, yes, I'm sure they did, and I'm sure they wanted to try to get my sister back home before my mom came home. Good point. Because they knew they would have been in trouble. Yes. You know, I mean, it was a tight-knit neighborhood. That's just, you know, we all knew each other. I knew those kids. I grew up with those kids. Any idea how Daniel might have known about this party at Robert Bassett's house? Would this have been in the same, like, school district? It would have been, like, a high school thing, like, you know, grapevine type of stuff? Or do you think that Alfredo and Daniel might have been talking in the days, in those two weeks before? Do you think that she just, or did she, how do you think she found out? Yeah, I'm sure she had been in contact. Um, You know, again, you know, I don't have any proof, but I do believe that she had been in contact with Alfredo um, prior to that party and that they had agreed that they would meet there. Okay. you know, I think she found out about the party from Alfredo. I do know that there were some high school kids at that party um, that, you know, were friends with Danielle, that, were, mm. you know, also were friends with Alfredo, his brother Alex, and Robert. Okay. Some of Danielle's friends were, one of Danielle's friends was in a relationship with Alfredo's brother. And that was be, that would be his younger brother? Yes. The one that who picked? Alex. Alex, the one who picked Danielle up at, in the park and took her to yep, the park. in a white town car. Mm-hmm. White town car. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should establish this. How did Brittany, a 14-year-old, even know Alfredo, who was well into his 20s, in fact, even older than you were at the time? How did they even know each other? Brittany was dating Roel, who was related to um, Alfredo. They were cousins. And Danielle, she was in the same grade as Danielle. She um, was good friends with Danielle. And that's how Danielle met Alfredo Sanchez. So it was through a friend of Danielle's who was also 14 years old. And she was dating a guy who was quite a bit older as well, into his 20s? Yes. He may have been more 19, 20-ish. Okay. But still, again, way too old to be dating a 14-year-old girl. I agree, Bonnie. I totally agree it, with it, that. It, you know, the, the, it was amazing that the family, that all of the boys in that family thought that that was okay. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's genetic to be a pedophile. I don't know. Yes. Yes, I totally agree with you on that. Uh, We've mentioned a name, Robert Bassett, a few times, and that's this party where Danielle seemingly disappeared from eventually. Um, What can you tell the listeners uh, about him? Did you, had you ever heard of his name before, or had your mother ever heard of his name to your knowledge before Danielle disappeared? Uh, Anything like that? What can you tell the listeners? No, I had never heard of Robert before this Robert came about came to find out that Robert Bassett who was 23 at the time um, was best friends with Alfredo Sanchez you know Mm he he he's a mean dude he is a mean vengeful violent man. Robert Bassett. Yeah. So so since 2001, he's he's maybe been in jail, has felonies on his record, things like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He has a history of domestic violence, statutory rape, lewd and lascivious behavior on children under the age of 16. Um, He's threatened members of my own family because we, whenever we put his name in the media, he gets very upset and he doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about this party that he was having. Where was this party? Was is it was it was at his mother's house, correct? And she was like uh, gone yes. or something his, like that. 
Yeah, from what I understand, his mother was at work when he was having the party. It was at his. He did live with his mother. Um, I, from what I understand, these parties were not. Uh, you know, this wasn't the only party that he had. I guess he was also known as you know having these parties and that's not drugs and alcohol to underage people. Um, mm-hmm. This was pretty, I think this was a pretty standard practice for uh, Robert Bassett. Okay. So what have you heard happened at, at this party? As, as best as we can tell, Daniel shows up there with Alfredo Sanchez's uh, younger brother, Alex. And what have you heard about that? Have you talked to any of the people who were at that party? Sure. How would they describe uh, Daniel's behavior there? And then we'll get into what Robert said happened in contrast to maybe a couple of the last party goes who saw Danielle there. But uh, what did people see? Um, what was Danielle doing at this party? Um, Danielle, was, it was, there were several reports that Danielle had been um, drinking and was heavily intoxicated at this party. Uh, when questioned, Robert Bassett said, and so did, you know, the whole crew, Alex, and said that she had gone home with a young lady named Stacy Kane Roberts, who was 14 at the time, and Kevin Daniel. Um, and that he said that she left his party with the two of them when questioned. Stacy Roberts and Kevin Daniels claimed that they did not leave with her, that when they left the party, she was still there. She was still at Robert's house. Okay, so Danielle could be physically impaired, some of them, you know, mentally impaired, drunk, maybe doesn't know what she's doing. And Stacy and Kevin leave. They say she's still there. Was Robert and his gang say, that Daniel left with them. Were Stacy and Kevin, to your knowledge, two of the last people uh, to leave this party, or were there several other, let's just call them innocent people, still there? To, yeah, do you know? witnesses. Yeah, there, you know, there were some other witnesses at the party that have come as well, contradicted, you know, Robert's statements that he, that she had left with Stacy and Kevin. Um, so mm-hmm. there were other people at the party left that said that she was still there and that when they left, she was still there with Robert that night. Okay. And we're going to get back to Stacy and possibly Kevin here in a moment. So we have contradicting stories as to whether when Danielle left, if she even left at all. But the, the most important part here is that she wasn't at home when your mother got home that night we had, you had mentioned this a little bit before, but what went on from that, I guess, Friday night into Saturday into Sunday and anything regarding looking for Danielle, trying to figure out where she went. And your mother or maybe you eventually talked to Stacy and maybe you can fill in uh, what she said and what she was saying over the, that weekend. All of that, if you could. I, Saturday, my mom started making phone calls. <laughs> to Danielle's friends trying to find out where she was. Stacy Roberts and her mother reported that that Danielle had stayed the night at her house with Stacy and that she was at the mall and then she was later at the pool and 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 just all kinds of crazy stories. Later come to find out that Stacy Kane Roberts was lying that day. Um, and then two, three other days later, she had sent us on a wild goose chase looking in other people's houses to try to check to check other places to see where Danielle was. But uh, essentially, she finally came off the truth that she did not, you know, Danielle was never at her house and that she had left her there with Robert. That Tonight, sounds Friday, really 28th. suspicious. That sounds really suspicious, Bonnie. Yeah, it does. That sounds, it sounds very suspicious that she claims that Danielle, I mean, on one hand, she's claiming that, that Danielle didn't go home with her, but then she's saying that, oh, Danielle's at the mall. She stayed at her house. She was over here. And it finally, I guess, several days later is when it comes out that she left Danielle at Robert's house. 
Correct. Uh, she was 14 at the time. It's 2001. It's 16 years later. So she would be 30. And uh, any of these years since, have you been able to, has she adequately been able to explain to you as an adult why she did that? Um, no. She, you know, I, I think that she was young at the time, and I think she was scared. I think Stacy knew what kind of people Robert Alfredo and, and Alfredo's brother and cousin were like. I think that she also was trying to at first cover up for her friend because uh, she thought that was the right thing to do. She didn't, didn't want Danielle to get in trouble. You know, so I I, I have not spoken to Stacy. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure that I want to because I, I don't think that she's going to be able to provide any additional information. I guess most importantly of this, let's just let, let me ask you this point blank. Do you believe her story that Danielle event was at, still at uh, Robert Bassett's house at Robert Bassett's house when she left? Do you believe that part yes. of the story? Do you believe that? Yes, I oh, do. But okay. I will never forgive her for lying for the first couple of days. Of course. Of course. Um, so you assisted in the search. What did the, what did the police do? While Stacy at that point was sending you all over the play, place, did the, when did your mother finally let the police know that something was wrong? And when, when did you find out? How did that all happen? And what did you do? Well, um, my mom called the police Sunday night and filed the report. I found out Monday morning because I just happened to call my mom and she was hysterical when it was early in the morning and my grandmother got on the phone and told me that I needed to come over there. My sister was missing. So by the time I got there, it was probably nine in the morning and the whole family was there. We were out searching. We, we paired up and just went everywhere from door to door. We searched ditches, woods, rivers. We searched everywhere we possibly could think of in the Cantonment area. My grandmother stayed at her house and that's when we were getting the phone calls from Stacy Roberts that, you know, we should maybe check here, we should maybe check there. My grandma would relay the information to one of my uncles who had a cell phone at the time. Not everybody had cell phones in 2001. <laughs> yeah. So um, we went on a wild goose chase in addition to searching where we could think of plus any place that Stacy Roberts suggested. I think at that point, I don't. I don't think Stacy was trying to be vengeful. I. I think that um, she had genuine concerns, and so couldn't find Danielle, and neither could she. What, do you remember at what point in this uh, those days after that you finally did hear about Robert Bassett's party? Did you? Did, did you or your mother or somebody else in your family or friends find out about it the next day, Sunday, Monday, or did some of those friends who took her to Danielle to the park tell you about it? How, do you remember when that happened? Throughout the following week, we started getting more information, you know, from talking to people. Uh, at first, we had relied on the police to start interviewing and talking to people. Um, but that never happened since they had classified her as a runaway. They put zero resources into finding her for the first couple years, actually. Oh, my. Um. Specifically where we found out that, you know, about the party, um, I, I think that it was just from, you know, from from kids in the neighborhood. And then we found out more information by going to Alfredo's neighborhood, which is the same neighborhood where the first party took place in the park and just questioning people um, and trying to get as much information as we could. And, um, it you know... I, after a, few, a couple of days, I went back to school and, and work and, and just tried to, you know, do, I, I would spend the nights 
passing out flyers across Pensacola, anywhere I could think of, all the way down to, you know, South Alabama, the beaches, and, and just making sure that there was a flyer on every gas station window, every store window. I mean, so I, that was at the time what I was doing. I, as far as the information and the details, you know, that my, my dad and my mom were really handling that, especially my dad, um, and trying to piece it together. Um, mm. and, and so for me at that time, it was a very confusing time. Um, it was very, there was a lot of rumors. Uh, one of the main rumors that always stuck out and that kept coming back up was that she had stayed the night with Robert or had, you know, intended on staying the night and that she was murdered by Robert Bassett, Alfredo Sanchez, his cousin and his brother chopped up and put into a hog pen because hogs eat everything except for the teeth. That's and horrible. That kept going. That's well, horrible. I, I, mean, I can't, I can't imagine being in that situation here and something like that. Well, you know, at first it was really hard to hear, but after you hear it, over and over again for 16 years you kind of become a little desensitized to it it's just a fact now to me it's a fact it's it's a fact that that rumor keeps coming up it's a it's a possible it's a possible ending to this case too yeah there's no proof of that but it's a possibility absolutely did the police in those uh once the police i mean they classified her as a, as a runaway, but did they ever go to Robert Bassett's house? Did they ever go inside the house? Did they ever talk to his mother? Anything like that in the first couple weeks, first couple months, anything like that? The police in official capacity. Yeah, they interviewed um, both Alfredo and Robert on multiple occasions. They... could never get them to say, you know, what happened. Uh, In the very beginning, Alfredo Sanchez claimed he didn't even know Daniel, as well as his younger brother, Alex. He also claimed he didn't know my sister. Even though all those Um, people saw him pick her up at that park that night, and those people, those kids at the park are surely more believable than Alex or Alfredo or Robert Bassett is. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Robert Bassett and Alfredo Sanchez are pedophiles. They're rapists. They're liars. Yeah. But the, uh, Robert never, of course, the case is still unsolved today. So Robert never, he stuck to his story that's, that Danielle left with Stacy and Kevin. What did Kevin have to say about all of this? I mean, was was he as... Um, did he he did he send anybody on a wild goose chase like Stacy did, or did he just keep his mouth shut? Or what do you remember him saying during this those first few weeks? I don't remember Kevin saying anything. He kept his mouth shut for the most part and just said that when they left, she was still at um, Robert's house. Okay, and just to give the listeners an idea. I know you weren't there, of course, but how big was this party? Would you say it was 20 people, 30 people? Oh, yeah, definitely, and if not more. There was around about 30 people at least. So it was a big deal. Lots of alcohol flowing and lots of other things flowing. And uh, Is this house like in a neighborhood? The neighbors would know that something was going on next door. There would be cars parked up and down the street, Mm -hmm. stuff like that, that kind of party. Yeah, yeah. And plus, yes, the party was in a rural area. You know, I mean, this is the country you're talking about. The, the the houses are spaced out by about two to three acres. So, okay. so there's plenty of room to have a party. And, you know, that's, it's definitely the country. Okay. Let's get back to Alfredo Sanchez a little bit. Was he cited at the party? Did people see him at the party? Yes. Okay. But 
he actually technically, at least at first, had an alibi for that night. What can you tell the listeners about that? Robert, I'm sorry, Alfredo's girlfriend at the time, or supposed girlfriend, baby mama, <laughs> had said that she was with her that night. Later came out that she lied for him because he told her to. He had been abusive to her, had threatened her, had threatened her life if she did not tell the police that he was with her that night. Mm -hmm. And you believe that, don't you? You believe that, that she was really afraid. I've since talked to her on the phone one-on-one. Yes, I believe her. Okay, and how long did she put up that fake alibi uh, for a year or two years or do you, any idea? Like years, years, would you years, say? Years, 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 okay. years. Yes, years. Okay. She, you know, she had, I know she had one child with Alfredo I, and the child was small at the time, you know, so it's, she told me on the phone She wholeheartedly believes that Alfredo Sanchez, Robert Bassett, Roel, and Alex Sanchez murdered my sister. And that she hopes that one day I find her body and that the four of them are put under the ground. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should say Roel. Who is Roel? Roel is Alfredo's cousin. Okay, so we have Alfredo Sanchez, we have his brother Alex, we have Alfredo's cousin Roel, and we have Robert Bassett, who are the like the main four, I guess you could call them. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now Alfredo, after Danielle disappeared, he disappeared. For how long? And to this day, do you or anybody else know where he went? Any what what can you tell the listeners about that? We tried to find Alfredo that following Monday evening to find out if he knew where my sister was. And we could not find Alfredo Sanchez. We went to his parents' house. He was not there. We tried to locate him for several weeks afterwards. He had disappeared off the face of the earth. We were later told that he went to work out of state with some family. And then he showed up about four weeks later with first didn't remember who my sister was. And then, and then second said, he didn't know anything about what had happened. So he goes away. Nobody knows where he is. We could take him at his word, or we could think that he was getting out of the area because he had done something wrong. Of course, it seems do you, to your knowledge, did Alex stay in the area? Did Roel stay in the area? Did Robert Bassett stay in the area? Was was Alfredo the only one who seemed to like disappear for those weeks? The way you remember, I know yeah. it's been a while. Is that he the only one that disappeared? Yeah, he was the only one that disappeared. Okay. And you have no idea. He could have gone to another state. He could have been in the area, just living in somebody's basement. We just don't know. Correct. Okay. So September 28th, 2001 is when Danielle disappears. You do this you try to figure out what happened to her. All these, some people leading you on a wild goose chase, some people putting up uh, lies as alibis, and then you don't find out for years. Um, unfortunately, and I know this happens in any case, disappearance case uh, that isn't solved right away. When did you kind of notice when, you know, maybe the leads and things started to like slow down and, you know, the police maybe kind of just threw their hands up in the air. I mean, w- how long after Danielle disappeared? Because I want to I go next, of course. We're going to go ahead to about 2005, 2006 with Alfredo Sanchez again. But back in 2001, you know, when did things start to slow down? I guess that's the easiest way to put it. About six months afterwards is when I kind of realized that whatever had happened was not a good situation and that she wasn't coming back. And that the lean started all kind of pointing in the same direction, which was that Alfredo and Robert and that crew had 
or the last people, you know, to have been involved with her or see her, um, and that they had reason and motive to kill her. Um, and the police, you know, had really just gotten started at that point in time, even doing anything with her case. It took them about three months before they really started doing their own investigation, as crappy as it was. Um, and so I would say six months is when I started to realize that she wasn't coming home. Now we can move up to about 2005, 2006, and we want to talk about this because as of, and we're doing this interview on November 24th, 2017, where is Alfredo Sanchez right at this moment? In prison. And he went to prison, uh, uh, I believe, back in 2007. Maybe you could tell the listeners how that all happened. Uh, During the summer of 2007, Alfredo Sanchez was charged with providing law enforcement with false information about his whereabouts at the time of my sister's disappearance. He was also imprisoned for, I believe, 30 years for lewd and lucidious acts against two minors, one of them being my sister. He was charged with, you know, raping my sister. And this is interesting because, of course, your sister, Danielle, is disappeared. She couldn't testify against him in 2007. How did she get, I guess, added to this case? And we don't want to use the other girl's name. Of course, she was a minor at the time. But how did that all get put together? Did this start with some other girl being raped by him and Daniel getting added, maybe you can clarify that, if you know. We were fortunate enough to have the most amazing detective come along in Danielle's case. And we've only, we've had several detectives, but we've only had one good detective. And his name is Mark Schmeister. And Mark Schmeister, when he took on my sister's case around 2004, 2005, invested his time and energy into helping us try to figure out what happened. And during his investigation, he learned that several females under the age of 16 reported that Alfredo Sanchez and Robert Bassett were known for providing alcohol and drugs, including date rape drugs, to these young females and raping them. One girl reported that she was almost, she was taken to a wooded area and had to fight for her life from Alfredo Sanchez because he was going to kill her because she did not want to have sex with him. We were fortunate enough that one of these young women were willing to testify against him and go to take it to trial. In addition, the court was petitioned to allow my mother to speak on my sister's behalf because two weeks before my sister went missing, if, if it was even two weeks before, she reported that she believed she was pregnant that Alfredo Sanchez had given her drugs and alcohol and had been having sex with her over the summer. Danielle told that to who? Your mother? My mother. Okay. And that was, um, that's very unique because, you know, I'm no legal scholar, but that almost, I'm not saying it is, but it it does sound like hearsay. I'm amazed that Alfredo Sanchez's lawyers, uh, you know, allowed that. That's very, I think that's very unique. Maybe I don't, I'm not, I don't know, but it sounds very unique. You, uh, were you surprised by that? I mean, I'm, I'm, I know you, you know, uh, of course appreciated that happening, but uh, were you surprised by that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was, one, I was thrilled that they were going to be able to do that. But two, you know, I did think it was a unique, um, you know, I, I'm certainly glad it happened, but yeah, absolutely. I have a 
undergraduate degree in legal studies, so I very okay. familiar with um, <laughs> what's needed to take a case to trial, and yeah. I was absolutely shocked. But after research, it has happened on multiple occasions across the United States. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so eventually, he was found guilty during this trial. I, I guess, uh, including the charges um, brought by the prosecutor, including your your sister Danielle's, the charges against Alfredo levied by. Danielle, even though she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And Alfredo went to jail, and like you said, it was for 30 years in 2007. So he's not going to be getting out anytime soon. Correct. Okay. He's, he's petitioned and motioned to, you know, okay. for, I'm trying to look for the right terminology, but he's, you know, he's, he's appealed several times and each time he appeals, he's uh, represented himself and he's done a very poor job of um, making his case. I uh, was fortunate enough a few years, uh, one of the last ones he did here uh, in Escambia County, um, watched him do it and he sh it's probably recommend in the next appeal he gets, he hires an attorney. Okay, so he's not exactly a jailhouse lawyer yet. <laughs> no, I mean, if he were smart enough, he would know to have petitioned the court to take off his shackles and be able to wear a suit while he was making his case. But he came in an orange jumpsuit in his handcuffs. It's pretty comical when you think about it. I agree. Is there a reason... Um, that if this was a gang of four, if we're to believe it was Alex, Alfredo, Ro Roy L, and Robert, that, like you said, Robert's been in jail, but he's walking around a free man, as far as we know, right at this second, that none of them got caught up in the charges that were brought against Alfredo. Any, any insight into that? And were any of them asked to be, you know, defendants or... You know, were they called into court then during any of these proceedings whatsoever back in 2007? Um, not well, I do know that they that the, the detectives have tried to find and talk to Alex Sanchez, but he always evades them. He kind of lays low and doesn't, uh, you know, do a whole lot. Um, anytime they've questioned Robert Bassett about any of these things, he sticks to a story and says he doesn't know anything. And, you know, he, he's, uh, he's been in and out of jail for other stuff. Okay. But nothing, not, not, yes, please. It does. Thank you. Uh, but nothing, none of the charges brought against Robert reached the level of what Alfredo has been charged with and went to jail for. Obviously not. Amazingly, no, it hasn't. I mean, when you look at this guy's rap sheet, you know, he's got felony battery escape traffic in stolen property interfering with child custody burglary multiple domestic violence cases and this guy does a couple years in prison gets out gets a job at a fast food restaurant keeps it for three or four months i mean you know this guy it's a mate what my point is is it's amazing to me that he hasn't gotten caught up in it and that he ha he's not in jail for anything related to this or that he hasn't been put in prison and kept in prison for some other type of charge because this dude is crazy. Well, you live up in the, that area. Uh, do you think it's just lucky or do you think that he has some connections or anything like that? Just lucky? Or... To be honest, I think he's just lucky. I think he does just enough to get in trouble but yet skirt, skirt stuff. You know, okay. he'll, he doesn't mind doing a couple of years in there, but one day this dude's going to either kill somebody again, or he's going to end up in prison for a really long time. This is, this is not the kind of dude you want your daughter dating. No. And he would be, he was in his what? Early twenties. 
Um, he maybe was 23, mid, 20, 23, 23, 24. back in 2001. So he would be getting close to 40 now. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, he has a birthday coming up in December. I do believe it's December 12th. Okay, so you even know so what his birthday he, is, okay. I know <laughs> a lot about these gentlemen. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Actually, uh, he, he, he just nailed it on the head. He's His birthday, he was born uh, December 12th, 1977, so he will be 40 years old. Four years. Okay. Happy birthday, Robert. Okay. I do need to, uh, you, you mentioned earlier that um, Danielle had mentioned to your mother that, that she was pregnant and that she yes. and Alfredo during that year, of, that year of, of the summer of 2001 had been having sex, of course, her being underage. But we just need to, say, <clears throat> need to state something for the record. There's no proof that she was pregnant. I know that's what she said, but okay. you don't have like a pregnancy test. There's never been a doctor who's come forward, anything like that, to your knowledge. Correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. You know, she had made it, my mom had made a doctor's appointment for the following week, the week of, you know, October 1st, to take her to the doctor to find out if she was pregnant. Um, you know, in, the, in my, my belief, as well as anybody who reads the case files and the facts, that Alfredo Sanchez murdered my sister because he didn't want to go to jail for statutory rape because his uncle had just been sentenced to prison for child molestation and you know my sister was grounded prior to her disappearance from going anywhere because my mom because you know she told my mom that she had been <laughs> she was in fact not babysitting his children she was over there doing drugs and drinking and, you know, doing things that she shouldn't have been doing. Yes, you had mentioned that uh, his uncle had gotten in trouble. In fact, in the Sanchez family, they kind of have a little bit of a family history of un uh, dating the men going out and raping underage women. They, doesn't Alfredo also have a son that was charged with that? Yeah, most recently his son was, yes. Okay. And I have... I'm not sure if his son is still a juvenile or not, so I will I'll, I'll give him the um, break and not mention his child's name on a national broadcast. Okay. Let's go back to Robert Bassett for just a little bit. You had told me that um, two things. One, tell the listeners about uh, the sewer of his mother's house, and then when, it, and when that happened and how that happened, and then – we can talk about this exchange he had with some woman on Facebook. What can we talk oh, yes. about there? Let's see. Um, I'm trying to get the exact date, but it was the Estimia County Sheriff's Office um, actually searched the sewer of Robert Bassett's house or his mother's house um, in 2000, I want to say 2000. Eight, nine, or ten. I, I can find the date here, but and you know, and nothing was found. I, you know, we'll mention that. Mm -hmm. Any idea on, <clears throat> on how that lead got started? How the police found out about that? Do you think it was like a shot in the dark? Any idea? I think the police actually started doing their job after Mark Schmeister came along, and they started oh, okay. actually investigating the leads. Oh, okay. Right. So that. That search coincided with that detective, the good detective, getting on those case for those those few years, and that's when that happened. Correct. Okay. But nothing was found, and, and truthfully, I'm no sewer expert. I don't know if any, even if something, if somehow Danielle was put in the sewer or something like that, I don't even know how it show up so many years later i don't know anything about that but obviously they yeah. thought that that was a, a good lead for some reason yeah i i just looked found the article um it was october 2010 the escamia county sheriff's office cold case unit um served a search warrant and uh searched that septic tank now you know that property had been searched before um with canine units from class kids and then other uh, Skimmy County Search and Rescue. Um, but that whole area has been searched with the diver dogs and horseback. You know, some areas are 
thick wooded so it's uh definitely we've had a lot you know despite what i feel is the escambia county sheriff's department failure to provide adequate investigation and search and rescue efforts in the beginning we've been very fortunate that class kids uh, their executive director brad dennis and his whole team have spent limited and i mean it, it, it's, it's amazing to me what these people do but they 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 sleep breathe and eat search and rescue and these people have searched multiple times for my sister multiple times and it, it, and it's people like that that give me hope you know and mm -hmm. that make a true difference in these cases mm -hmm. uh that brings me a, a question it's not uh, i wasn't planning to ask you about this but if you've had a chance to uh, talk to brad dennis or any other people that work for that organization um do they happen to know being that you talked about uh, we're gonna that this will be mentioned in the discussion robert bassett had with this one online but do brad dennis and the other these people uh, buy into the idea that danielle was fed to hogs and if that's the case did and alfredo sanchez know anybody who has a farm where he could have done that do did you, have you ever talked to Brad Dennis about that? Uh, you know, Brad Dennis um, has not specifically told me that that's what he believes happened. Mm -hmm. uh, my conversations with him are that he believes that, you know, her body will be found somewhere in this area is what he's told me. Okay. You know, he's never made it a specific you know, a uh, fashion in which he believes she's been murdered, but he does believe that we will eventually find her body in this area. Okay. So he's not, what you're saying is, I guess he's not necessarily buying into any particular theory of uh, if Danielle's not with us anymore of what happened to her, but he's just securing the idea that if you keep searching, you'll find her, you know, one way or the other. That, however, the those in class kids that maintain my sister's case files believe theorize that alfredo sanchez and robert bassett have something to do with my sister's disappearance mm -hmm. there is zero question about that i agree in the way in which she was murdered because she was murdered and they murdered her. I know that. I I just, I know it. And I'm going to eventually find out how and where she is. Mm. But the who is never been a question. Mm. The where is the question. Where did they put her body is the question. And as I said before, I will find out. It may not be today. It may be 20 years from now, but I will find her body. I believe you, Monty. I believe you. The conversation with Robert on, we're not going to mention the woman's name that he had this conversation with, but when did this conversation happen? And I guess it was somewhat in public, being that it's on Facebook. <laughs> what, what did, uh, we'll just have to keep it PG because neither of them, um, both of them use some very adult language, but what was the essence of this conversation that Robert had with somebody uh, online on Facebook? First of all, when did this conversation happen? Do you know? This was 2013. About 2013 is when, it, yeah, it's been about four years. So I would say summer of 2013 is when this happened. I was actually um, sleeping in that morning and got a text from one of Daniel's friends and uh, that I, you know, that I had been, Danielle was friends with her in high school, and, you know, she had been a good, really good supportive uh, friend of Danielle's ever since the disappearance and showed up to her vigils and whatnot. But so I, I wasn't used to talking to her on a regular basis, so I thought it was strange. I get this text message with a screenshot and said, uh, this was in a 
Facebook forum, closed private group. Alfred or uh, Robert Bassett had posted this statement here. Uh, essentially, let me just give you a little bit of background. It, 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 it appears that he had been getting into some type of cyber argument with this uh, young lady on in the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And she says, um, what did you do with that white girl, Danielle? You were the last one seen with her. And he responds back in a hog pen where you need to be as well. So. Interesting. So that hog pig slash pig uh, theory pops up again 12 years after Daniel disappeared. Yeah, and there's also a neighborhood in the area um, named Wedgwood um, that's known for being a little less than ideal. Mm -hmm. And supposedly there's a hog pen in that neighborhood or an area that they call the hog pen. I've never uh, gone and checked it myself, but... Um, I do believe it's been searched, but you know, it, it it's just another thing that Robert Bassett, you know, he just he's he's not a good dude. He's not a good person. Right. And 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 the and the and the mere fact that you would actually post that in an open forum or make that statement when asked, what did you do with that girl? I mean, what does that say? I mean, we, so please tell me, what does that, what does that tell you? What does that mean? I don't know. You know, I, I do a lot. Of course, I've done over 50 of these cases so far. But, um, you know, in the, I think recently I said to another guest that, you know, in the world that you and I live in, if we are uh, accused of murder, that actually brings our reputation down, you know, because we have high character. You know, if anything like that happens, our, our reputation is going to go down. But these guys, uh, the circles they run in, if they're thought of as having murdered somebody, their reputation actually goes up. Yeah. And um, and I agree with you that Alfredo and Robert are the main suspects in Daniel's disappearance. But, you know, in their world, them posting something like that and having gotten away with it at that point for 12 years... You know, they may think, well, reminding people of something that we're accused of, although we haven't been charged with yet, reminds them of everybody of maybe how tough they are or something. It's it's something that's hard to relate to in my world or, or your worlds, but it's probably what's going through his head, you know, on top of the or fact he's... that he just hates women <laughs> on top of that. Yeah, absolutely. Or he just sees them as disposable. Yes, right. You and the police, um, although you say you had one good uh, detective on the case in the last 16 years, uh, there was a story you told to me about something that they were kind of shuffling their feet on, and you just took it upon yourself to find out if this rumor was true. What can you tell the listeners about that? And I would, this is, I think, a good lesson for all those guests out there who, you know, want to take, you know, the bull by the horns and do things themselves. What, what can you tell the listeners about that? Well, I, one of the challenges with Danielle's case has been rumors. Um, you know, beyond, you know, the rumors are the hog bin, there's been hundreds of people that, you know, have either provided uh, false leads or lied, you know, one way or the other. So I've gotten really good at deciphering, you know, who's lying and who's telling the truth. Well, I get a, I get a message. And people love social media these days. And I got a message to social media of a friend, from a friend who had been in a conversation with somebody about Danielle and that this girl had told, uh, told this woman that Danielle was, or that she was there the night Danielle was murdered. And then, so, you know, the woman was a family friend she contacted me and said, hey, this person is saying that, you know, she was there the night Danielle was murdered. And I said, okay, interesting. You know, what's her name? Blah, where does she live? Can I get all that information? Will she be willing to talk to me? Well, I got the girl's information um, and I went to her house and I asked her that 
well, I, well, first let me say this. I got the information, passed along to the police, the detective at the time, gave him the address of where this girl was located, and asked him if he would follow the lead up. Two weeks had passed, and he had not been able to find this girl to ask her about, you know, what her claim. So I went to the young lady's house. She was sitting in her garage. And I said, hi, I'm Bonnie. I'm Danielle's sister. I heard you might have some information about my sister's case. And she said, um, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't make any claim about your sister's case and asked me to leave. That's all it took for me to find out and know that this girl was lying. This girl was a drug addict just seeking her five minutes of attention. And I was able to text the detective back and tell him that he no longer needed to pretend like he was trying to talk to her, that I had done it for him, and that she was lying. So the information was, mm. you know, not applicable to her case. And remind the listeners, when was this again that this happened? Um, that was back in 2014. So about three 2015, years maybe. 2000, yeah, just a couple of years ago. Okay. And so you're still very sure this couple of years later that she knows nothing about this case. She cannot be helpful in any way. She's just... Absolutely. Stuck. Okay. I'm positive she was <laughs> just making stuff up. Okay. Which won't be the first time or the last time somebody will do that. No. You can't and, you can't believe everything that somebody has to say about this. You, you just can't. That's true. That's true. Uh, I'm not saying it happens in every case that I cover, but in a lot of the cases I cover, there's so many rumors flying around that uh, it's hard to distinguish the 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 truth from the the fiction. And mm -hmm. in, in many cases, it could all be fiction. There's probably mm -hmm. there's more likelihood of it all being fiction than it all being truth. That's for sure. Correct. So mm -hmm. I, I understand the, the the issue that you've had over the like the last sixteen years, especially considering that most of the people involved are teenagers, you know, that yep. were at this party, for example, or Brittany, the the girl who didn't introduce Danielle to Alfredo and Stacy, and these kids who went to the park. There's only a couple adults involved, and these adults who are in their twenties are probably the criminals. It's hard to it's hard to get a lot of facts that way. Absolutely. It's hard. So where does this case sit right now? Um, when do you think the last time it was that Alfredo was even asked about Danielle in any way? It's been, you know, same case where Robert, he and Alfredo, it's probably been five or six years. It's not longer since they've been questioned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, they have been questioned several times in the past, and they both, you know, stick to their story. They don't know anything. And it's just interesting to me that Robert Bassett is the one who, although he's been in jail, he's been out of jail a little bit as well in the last 16 years, that he's never rolled over on. Nope, he has not. He's never rolled over on Alfredo. And whereas I think you believe that although you put those four all into the same group, it seems to me that Alfredo is kind of the ringleader. You know, I, I don't think that Robert would have done something to Danielle without, you know, Alfredo's okay or, or something like that. Is that how you would portray uh, the relationship between that gang as well, that Alfredo was the ringleader pretty much? Um, I think that's a possibility. Uh, I, uh, Alfredo and Robert were best friends. Um so I would say there's a chance that, you know, yeah, Alfredo could have definitely been the decision maker in that group. But I also, but I feel like no matter what the dynamics were and that in some ways Robert was Alfredo's do boy who mm. came behind Alfredo and cleaned up his messes. Okay. And, um, 
mm-hmm. you know, looking at Alfredo, when you look at him, he's a tiny little dude. He's small. And he kind of looks a little weak. Robert is this huge, very substantial guy, you know. He's not somebody that you'd want to come in contact with in a dark corner or in an alley. It it is just... Mm -hmm. So uh, the dynamics there are are, kind of interesting. I think... um, Mm -hmm. I don't think either one of them are very smart. I think they're just lucky. Lucky to this point, 16 years yeah, later. So far, so far, yeah. yeah. To your knowledge, are there any other missing people, men or women, who can be connected to Alfredo, to um, his brother, to Roel, and to Robert Bassett? To your knowledge, uh, do you think that they might have, uh, frankly, murdered anybody else, men or women? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. All of the women that they've raped, I've been lucky enough to get away from them. And to your knowledge, after Danielle disappeared, did these guys continue to do what they were doing? I know Alfredo disappeared for a while, but once he came back, did they just go back to their old ways? Or did did they get any, there was any signs that Danielle's disappearance might have caused a pause in what they were doing? For, for a while, they did lay a little low, you know, a good year or two. But after that, no, they were they were hopping back on the train after that. Mm-hmm. And maybe I should ask you this. This other girl who was part of this case that eventually put Alfredo in jail, was this a girl that uh, was before Daniel disappeared or after Daniel disappeared, or was it around the same time? And was this a girl around that Daniel— same- it was around the same time. I do believe it was a little bit before. Um, the girl is a juvenile, a minor, so I don't even know her name. Okay, that's fine. Know. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Did Danielle know her, though? Do you think Danielle knew her? Or was she uh, from, from somewhere else? From what I understand, that, from what I've been told, yes. What has this done to your family in the last 16 years, Bonnie? You know, your mother, who, uh, of course, had told Danielle to stay home that night, your father, um, and you and your brother. Well, um... I think in regards to your question, I can really only speak um, to, to, to myself. Um, I think that uh, I I can give you a little bit of insight on in general, what it's done to all of us is it's, um, it's been hell. It's been absolute hell. And, you know, it's, it's, you have to learn a new way of life. And you can either thrive or let it eat you alive. Um, you know, many people in our family have, you know, chosen to go on with their life and re- try to lead a normal life and are doing very well at, at, at that, you know, including my father and my brother. Um, I myself have you know, took me several years to figure out how to uh, live in this situation and and find balance between, you know, keeping my sister's case in the in the in the public um, view, um, you know, helping other people, um, and, and just maintaining a a balance in in my life and I think that for me being able to meet other people who have been through the same situation um other other family members of missing persons yeah has been extremely helpful um it's it's a new way of life let me just say that and it's not it's not a good way I mean it's it can be very lonely if you let it it can be very depressing um, if you allow it to be that way. But, you know, I, I think the key here is keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. Keeping my sister's story out there and not stopping. Yes. Is there a possibility, that, is your hope maybe that Robert Bassett or... Alfredo's brother, one of these other guys, does something wrong. 
uh, that maybe charges can be brought to them and they'll roll over on Alfredo or just come clean on the whole thing? Or, or what else is your concern? What other could be your concern and what are you looking out for? As far as I'm concerned, they could all walk the streets freely if they told us where my sister and led us to my sister's body. I have advocated for that for a good year now um, with the state attorney's office. Legalities will not allow them to do that. Um, I've said, hey, why don't you let Alfredo Sanchez walk free and live his life as he sees fit if he tells us where her body is? And we have actual DNA evidence of where she is. That we have something. We have her body. Um, but what's more than likely going to happen is that, uh, you know, Robert will continue to go in and out of jail and nobody's going to say anything. Alfredo's never going to get out. He's going to be sitting in there for years and nothing's going to get done. Mm -hmm. You know, and one thing that I've kind of wrapped my mind around and try and prepared myself for because I know that each time I use Robert Bassett's name to get this and, and get this story out because his name is involved in this story yeah. as a fact sure. that I'm going to get harassed by him after this whether it be through Facebook messages phone calls etc but a, again yeah. I just want it to be known that I'm not going to stop. Yeah. He does not scare me. Yeah, and you can't help it that the facts of the case make him look guilty. That's, that's just the correct. way that's just the way it works, Robert. That we can't help it that the facts of the case, her being at your house and people who haven't been in jail since 2001 are claiming that she didn't go home with them, but they claim that she was still there at your house and you have been out of jail, in and out of jail the last 16 years. We can't help that those are the facts. You know. And if again, they... as I've stated, I, I told you in the beginning, and I have documentation and proof of everything that I've said. I know. And I'm happy to turn that over to anybody that needs it. I know. I know you do. I know you do. Um, and I, and uh, you would not be the first person. I, I had a guest on here, uh, Lee Clifton, who is a friend of mine. She coincidentally lives very close to me here in uh, Madeira Beach, but she was a guest for the disappearance of Kelly Rothwell. And uh, she's been harassed over the last five or six years by the main suspect in Kelly's case. You know, her, her accounts have been hacked and people impersonating her and everything else. And I think I've run into that a couple other times in a couple other cases as well. And oh, yeah. all, all yeah. that does is make these people look even more guilty than they already look. That's really all it well, does. What they're, what they're, all they're trying to do is intimidate you and get you to shut up. They don't want you running your mouth because my word, my, my voice is what people are listening to. My voice is what carries my sister's story and life into the present and what triggers people to say, Hey, you know, I, yeah. I heard this or, you know, or I believe that, uh, you know, I know somebody that may know some information. Yeah. And, uh, and again, you know, all of their tactics, I'm prepared for all of them. I have been, quiet and i was quiet for the first 10 years because i had to figure out how to do this but i'm ready now and nothing's gonna stop me i'm not gonna keep my mouth shut uh bonnie we've we've only known each other for about three weeks but yes you definitely seem the type like the type of person who isn't easily intimidated nope <laughs> not at all <laughs> You're very, uh, you have strong convictions, very opinionated, you know what you know, and uh, that does not surprise me that, that Robert or anybody else is going to, you know, take you away from your goal. That doesn't surprise Absolutely. me at all. Yeah. Where can, where can, uh, yeah, when, when, where can uh, the listeners find a little bit more about 
Danielle's case about you, uh, you know, any, you know, where they could go Facebook or otherwise regarding Danielle's disappearance. Sure. Yeah. I have a um, Facebook page for Danielle. It is titled actually, let me see here. I'm at missing child, Danielle Bell. Um, she's on Facebook. Okay. And I am the admin for that page. Okay. Um, you know, if you do a Google search, you'll find several, um, you know, websites and forums on Danielle's case. Sure. Um, I've, I've seen them. North, yes. Yeah. North of Scambia, um, North of Scambia.com is a, uh, on, online, um, excuse me, online, um, news source for the area that Danielle went missing from. Um, and, and the gentleman that runs that, she just has done several excellent articles that are still available about Danielle's case. But, you know, for, I, I use Danielle's um, Facebook page for most of my communication and okay. you know, people contact me through there with um, information and, you know, um, that right. gets, you know, when, when applicable, it gets moved on to you know, your law enforcement or class kids for follow up. Okay. Uh, and I um, will, great. And I will be posting uh, about uh, pictures of Danielle. And of course, coming up, of course, by the time people are listening to this, they'll know this, but um, I will have, you know, posted to the link on Facebook and anything else, Charlie Project, those other places where mm -hmm. Danielle's information and uh, her story is posted. So you can expect me to do that. Just not Excellent. up in the lead up to our episode, but in the weeks, months, and years uh, that I'll be doing this program, I, I always keep my listeners and the public, you know, involved in all this stuff. And I'm always reposting old episodes and things like that. So you can you can look for that as well. Okay, great. So um, any last words, Bonnie? Uh, no, just... Nothing about Danielle's case. Just thank you for what you're doing and uh, helping people like me keep her story, you know, out in the public and, you know, to your listeners for their interest. And if there are other family members listening to this, um, please reach out to me through Danielle's Facebook page, Missing Child Danielle Bell. Um, you know, we have to stick together. <laughs> And we all have to be supportive of each other and continue our mission of finding what happened, you know, where our missing person is. Bonnie, thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Bonnie Anderson, sister of Danielle Bell. I thank her for being on the program. I'm sure every parent with a daughter Here's this interview and shudders. This is the most extreme of the fears parents have about their daughter sneaking out to meet some boy or some man. And even in my own family, we've had those things happen. Most time, nothing bad happens. The girls grow up, lose interest with that boy, and before the parents know it, she's 27 years old and getting married to the best guy in the world. Then there are circumstances like Danielle's. Girls who fly out of the safety of their home, their nest, to meet the wrong guys, and they don't recover. And really, I'm not sure if parenting could have changed hers or any other girl's behavior regarding circumstances like this. Danielle was intent on going to the party, so she did. The grounding didn't work. The only problem was that as a teenager, she couldn't appreciate the danger she was putting herself in. The only fix probably would have been if she'd never met Alfredo and Rob at all. Two men who I'm sure should have been in jail for all the underage girls they met before Danielle. This is also one of the cases where the suspects are known. There's not much of a mystery here. Like the disappearances of Kelly Rothwell, Jesse Foster, and others we've featured on Unfound. So I ask you, what should Bonnie and her family do now? How can the four men mentioned during this episode be brought to justice for what they did to Danielle Bell? I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to 
unfound.